Good afternoon. It's May the 20th, 1999. I'm Mayo Livingston, and this afternoon, Tom Bush and I, on behalf of the Southwest Georgia Regional Library, are interviewing Ken Markham on his experiences in World War II. In the United States Army, through the years, one of the most elite of all the units were the Rangers. And the greatest of those were the Derby Rangers who served in the European campaign. Ken was part of that elite group, and we are fortunate to have him to relate his experiences, particularly at Angio and during the Italian campaign. Ken, tell us how you came about being in the Derby Rangers, and what was the noise of the 2nd Battalion? 1st. 1st Battalion, the, the original 1st. Uh, the uh, <coughs> Derby Rangers was a organized in Hackney Carey, Scotland, under uh, orders of uh, General uh, Marshall. He sent orders for, to organize a ranger a group to, to be trained by the British commandos. And they were to be the elite, I mean, the first troops to go into action because the DF raid was coming up and they wanted uh, an American force to go in there to fight with the British commandos. And this would have been, this was, and the Rangers did go in at DF. Right. Tell us a little bit about DF. Well, I was not there. There was only 50 Rangers in the whole unit. I mean, uh, all the Rangers that went in. And uh, General, I mean, Colonel, uh, Captain Murray, I believe it was, it was the uh, officer in charge, but he he, ne he never did get in. You know, it was a messed up affair because it was, the the Germans uh, caught, uh, a patrol boat caught them up to uh, the invasion force coming in, mostly Canadians and British commandos. And uh, we had 50 men in there. And I got a friend, Alex Zima, who lives down here in Fort Myers, Florida. He was one of them. I saw him last weekend. But uh, they, uh, it was, uh, the Germans were waiting on them and they got in there and they couldn't, they couldn't get up on those, those shores. Uh, and they, they just butchered them. And we lost several thousand people there. The, the, the Allied forces did, and uh, I ran into in a boy that was in, I was in prison camp in uh, Stalag 7A down in, uh, down in Munich, Germany, right out of Munich, and a uh, boy by the name of Sergeant Taylor, he was down there, he was one of those boys that was captured, uh, he was wounded there, a piece of shrapnel cut across his head, and he was uh, in the hospital for a long while, but he he finally died, but he was in his prison camp. I got to talk to him quite a while. It was, it was a rough go. Now, you were trained in Scotland. The uh, the battalion was, and this was the first battalion, and they, you might say they got blooded up at, at DF. Right. And they came back and you finished your training, and uh, and then then you were assigned to uh, uh, Sicily or in no, Italy? In, in Italy? Africa. 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 Our zoo, which is right below Oran. Were you in that group? No, I was not in. Yeah. I hadn't joined yeah. them at that time because I, I, I didn't go across seas till the uh, uh, middle of 40, er, early part of 43. Early part of 43, I landed at Casablanca. And, uh, and then I joined the Rangers up, up around uh, Oran. Were well, they still fighting in North Africa? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yes, they was fighting around Tunis and, uh, and uh, Kazarine Pass and that kind of mess up there. Uh, why did you join the Rangers? <laughs> I mean, Ken Markham, you were, you told me about being involved with spec towns and all that, and uh, uh, you, you're tall and lanky and all that, but... Well, what? It, really what... I had a friend come through there from my hometown. He and I went to high school together. Where was your hometown? Decatur, Alabama. And he uh, uh, he had been up to the front line. He'd been wounded three times. And he was coming through this replacement depot. And he got to tell him, talk to me, and tell him. And I I was a big old football player, and he was a little old runt, you know. And I figured if he could take it, I could. So uh, then I, I, this guy came in, uh, Captain uh, Shuster. He was the epitome of a ranger. He was physically big, strong, muscular, very, very determined individual. 
he was the best combat soldier I ever saw. Darby said he was the uh, he was his number one. I mean, if he had to have one man with him up on the line, he'd really have him. But he came into our camp that day and had a machine gun up on top of a, a, a jeep, and he fired that thing over the several hundred of us ahead, you know, and he trying to attract attention. And he said, now, if y'all want to go to a unit that is a fighting unit and you're going to see some excitement, he said, come with me. And, and you know, I was big enough for him to do it. <laughs> now, that wasn't, that wasn't Colonel Darby. No, that was, that was, that was Chuck Shunstrom. Now, Darby, it got to, it, it always had the name Darby's Rangers. Right. Because he was always the commander. Well, he was, he was, he was the one who organized the Rangers in, uh, in Acrocarious County under the orders of General Marshall. And he was a, a West Point graduate of 1933, I believe it was. And he was, a, went overseas as a captain in the artillery. And uh, he was an aide de camp to uh, the uh, general of the 34th general of the 34th division there in England. And when the marshal wanted to organize that, he had to have somebody to hit it. So this general Truscott, General Truscott, uh, said uh, uh, Darby begged and pleaded with him to, to let him have a chance to do it. So he did. He gave him a chance. And he, he very, very brave, smart. If there's anything I think it was probably wrong with Darby, he was too aggressive. <laughs> I mean, he he, he, well, he, we, he would stick his head out. We're going to get into that in a minute, particularly at Angio. But the Rangers were really organized and trained overseas. They were oh, not yeah. trained now. They were trained up at Fort Benning, I believe. Yeah, yeah, they're trained uh, at... Uh, oh, well, excuse me. Uh, when you, you were trained in North Africa and you fought on through the, uh, to, the Tunisian campaign, and uh, the next, the next campaign was Sicily. Did you fellows get in on that one? Yes. Now I tell you, the, the one of the most successful raids of, uh, I mean, uh, 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 battles of the Rangers was called uh, uh, Shan. No, uh, uh, it was uh, called. Uh, it was a raid we pulled back to the the German lines. Went back about 10, 15 miles and. 3,000 Italians and Germans up there. And, was this in Tunisia? Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is in Africa, in North Africa. And uh, went in there and we hit them at night. We had to march all night and, and bivouac in the desert and then the cam on the camouflage sheets that's supposed to keep the planes from spotless. Then we attacked the next day and uh, we, and that's where the American, the Rangers got the uh, nickname of the uh, American gangsters. That's what the Italians call us. American gangsters. Because we, we were slipping in. We, 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 we. Put, them, put them away. But that was one of the most successful. Now, we got three battle, I mean, presidential unit citations. First range of time. Yeah. And that was one up for that. And uh, we got one at uh, in Sicily. Then we got one in Italy. And uh, Darby, well, in North Africa, after after this uh, raid, uh, but uh, the after the raid, we went back and they divided the first range battalion into, into three range battalions. They made the first, third, and fourth range battalion, and it took the cadre out of the first range battalion and put over into and in in organized the third and fourth. Well, that. Second and fifth range of battalion was organized here in the states at that time. They were being trained in uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, I believe it was, and they and uh, that Fort Pierce, Florida, you know, in, in landing. But the uh, they would later go in on D-Day. That's right. Okay. Second and fifth range of battalion, uh, second range of battalion went in on Pont de Hoc, and the fifth range of battalion landed in Omaha Beach. And uh, by the way, they leave on June the 10th uh, to go back over for the 55th anniversary. Oh, ain't that And as eight of the, our boys going over, I'm not going over because, because I can't relate to that because I was in, in the mountain down in Italy when they hit the hit. But there's, uh, we, well, they were all up here at Fort Benning the other day with us. At, uh, uh, most of them, and it was, it was about eight, ten of the boys going over there. 
But I, if I ever go back, I want to go back to Italy. I want to go back down there where. Well, I, I can't. I don't blame you. You want to know where it was. Well, now. Where I to go back to. Was uh, did you fellas get in on Sicily? Yes. Were you? Yes. Thirty-five days down there. There you go. But uh, it was. Uh, it was. What? It was Rocky Mountains. Uh, uh, fighting, but uh, it didn't last long. The Germans weren't uh, that strong down there. Well, you know, Ken, we don't get a lot of discussion about North Africa and Sicily. Uh, even part of the, the Italian campaign is, is uh, most of our attention is in France and Germany in the Battle of the Bulls, D Day. But uh, and, and this is what you are telling us about. And uh, the other day when I was here talking to your friends, uh, they mentioned Salerno. Well, Salerno yeah. was uh, was the, the after the the invasion. Which came first, Salerno? Salerno, and then Anzio. Yeah, and Anzio. But the Salerno, the uh, I have a friend over here. Uh, uh, I want to tell you about him. Randall Harris. He was a uh, he was a uh, staff sergeant, but he landed in Sicily, and uh, he was very he was a very brave woman. Most of the Rangers were, were brave, I would say. They were, they were sticky make out. Mm -hmm. But this guy got there and had a pretty rough landing there. And, and uh, he, uh, he strapped him across his stomach and cut his stomach open. Mm -hmm. And his guts was hanging out. Now, this is facts. And he, he didn't do a thing but pull his web belt up and he let his stand up his head. Mm -hmm. He lived out in California right now, right on the Harris. He received a DSC. And in the Rangers, I'll, I'll let you know one thing. Darby, this is Darby's talking. He said, boys, he said, you don't get medals in this outfit. He said, what you, what these boys get medals for, you do every damn day. That's your job. And so you don't get medals. Don't expect medals for, for a battle here because you're not going to get it. And only, only he, Randall Harris got the DSC. And Darby got the DSC presented to him by somebody else because, uh, but uh, that was over two DSCs I know of, and, and several seven silver stars. But uh, he just didn't pass by. Oh, you got well, a, you got a Purple Heart. Well, now Darby, before we get back to Salerno, Darby made it almost all the way through the war before he was killed as a brigadier general. I think you told well, me. Well, he was he was still a colonel, but he was posthumously uh, made a brigadier general in, in two days before the war ended in Italy. Yeah. And he was uh, killed. He was outside of his uh, uh, headquarters talking to these guys, and he uh, 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 artillery shell landed across the street, and a piece of shrapnel hit him right in the heart. And just a little. Old Piece, you, you couldn't believe us while it was yeah, down. And just, just like, pierced his heart and didn't kill it. Right yeah. Now. now, Salerno, well, we started leapfrogging up the Italian coast. Salerno was first. Right. We'd taken Sicily. And then we, we came in at Salerno. Uh, now, Salerno, we got, we, we survived. And yeah. then came Angio that you were telling me about the other day. <laughs> well, really, what? what the next step was we went up from Salerno to, to Naples. Okay, and, all right. Naples, and then we got to Naples, and we uh, first, third, and fourth ran the potato. We had to reorganize because we, you know, uh, in the Rangers we were always fighting. I mean, we was always on at the hot spot, and uh, we had a lot of turnover in my unit. I, I would say that we would have a. I've had as high as 100% turnover in a month in my unit because of it. But another thing is, I'll tell you about combat is that once you get in there, you learn the ropes a little bit. If you can survive the first six weeks in, in the home combat, in combat, you, you'll make it a pretty long while because you, you're kind of in the know. You, you know the sergeants or the, like the lieutenants or so, what have you. And, they send a little little green guy out there to get shot. They won't send you that. <laughs> That's well, the truth. Now you mentioned to me that you were, uh, and you were in all these battles. Were you uh, were you the first were you, were you first scout? Yes, yes, I was first scout in the uh, in Fox Company, the first Rangers Battalion. But we went up to Angio. Uh, uh, 
I mean, went up to casino. Mount Casino was where they had the monastery on top of the hill, and uh, they eventually had to bomb it uh, to, to get the, the Germans out from the, uh, as, a, as the, uh, these unit or, or observations at post. But anyway, we was, they sent us over to Benefro Valley, which is right next to Casino. You had taken an angel at that time? Yeah. No, no, this is before that. This okay. is down, it's down right below, uh, above Naples. Oh, okay, all right. I'm sorry. But we got up there and in, uh, in Benefro, and uh, it was actually cloud, uh, the mountains were the high, above the clouds. I mean, uh, they were, you would, you could get the fog. You couldn't see two feet in front of you. Up there. Good. But anyway, Darby was, uh, had General Patton. He had General Truscott, he had General Mark Clark, and uh, Lucas, General Lucas was on a hill over there. And his, he, he was a showman, Darby was a showman. He said, now I'm gonna show you all how to knock uh, the Germans off this hill. And it was, they just saw it up there. But we had 4.2 mortars, which were heavy mortars. And we had white phosphorus, and he, he laid down a barrage of white phosphorus border up ahead and, and just burnt that hill off. And well, I was down there, we had a company front. He said that when I uh, let up on this barrage, he said the company front will charge up there. It was about 200 yards up there. And I, I being the first guy, they put me over here on this left flank, and there was a cliff right straight down there. I was protected from this side because of the cliff. It was just straight down. I didn't see how they get, they get me from that side. So all I had to worry about was in front of him. But there was a boy from the 45th Division who had been up there a few days before and he got killed and he was out there and he was exploded up this big rat. And I had to get close to him and go around. And that worried me, but I just wondered how in the world he got killed. I said, uh, so I started, with my, my antennas was up. And I walked along this cliff over here on the left flank. And I had tracer bullets in my rifle. And I, if I saw anything move up there, I was gonna, I was gonna shoot fire tracer bullets over here. And there's another uh, scout, a second scout over here on the right hand flank. He was gonna cross the knife. And then we could, we could pinpoint the object. But anyway, I got up there and I don't know, you know, but they told me we were going to top of the hill up there, you know. I took it by the word. I, I was going, I was ready to go. I was going to go up there and get it, get it over with. But I got about 50 or 60 yards in front of the rest of the company. You're, you're right. I got about 50 or 60 yards in front of the company and old, old Jim Brennan, this boy that you met here the other day, he, he and the rest of my boys in my company, uh, uh, decided that we were going to, uh, they saw me up there 50 or 60 yards in front of everybody else. And I went through this passageway the rock up there on top of that hill, and Doug going and what and uh, this German was sitting there waiting for me, and he, a bullet clipped me across the helmet. I dropped, I came back, and I started throwing grenades over on top of that. And old German got, got frisky, he, 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 I got pretty close to him, so he was going to come get me. So he come around that rock and tried to get me, and the old sergeant's ready to shot him right to the head, right there. and he fell right on top of it. But that was my, that was, that was, yeah, that was that was at Monte Casino. No, that, that was Benefro Valley. Right, Benefro okay. Valley, and that was uh, right next to Monte. Well, Mount. did you? Well, after they bombed Monte Casino, did you take? Did you boy? Were you all in the take, or did the British? Uh, the, the, British, British the, the French, Polish, French the actually, British. French actually took Monte Casino. I think uh, they pulled us out of line because yeah. uh, we lost uh, we lost a lot of men at the casino of uh, Benefro Valley. And uh, we had to go back down and, and recruit and retrain. Now you were part of the American Third Army, a uh, Fifth Army, Fifth Army, Fifth Army, and the British was Eighth Army. Right. And uh, uh, you, you and your friends both commented that uh, the, the intelligence of the, the Americans wouldn't listen to the British, and the British wouldn't listen to the Americans. I mean that the, the intelligence got all screwed up or whatever. You know what, what was actually going to happen, and where, 
And you didn't realize that some of the best German troops, the Hermann Goring Division, the paratroopers, the paratroopers, is what, is what you were up against. That's right. Uh, the thing about it, I, I think it, uh, uh, see, the, as I understood it, General, now I went to the personal, I went to the briefing of the Anzio. I went at Anzio, we had a briefing after we made the landing and so forth and so on. We you got to show, okay. Oh, yeah, we were landed there, no problem whatsoever. We ran into one scout car running and we knocked it out right quick. And we went on out about five miles in Bifway. We stayed and went out patrol every night, all day, all night. We patrol. Uh, and we'd go out five, six miles and try to make contact. If we didn't make contact, we'd work our way back. That was all we did there for five days. <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, once we, uh, uh, Darby was pushed by General uh, Browning. Now General Browning was the, uh, was the British, he was in command of the, of the uh, Eighth Army. Of, of Eighth Army. And he was in command of the, the Angio deal. But Clark, of course, up there, and he's, he had a boy, a fellow by the name of Lucas, General Lucas was there. General Lucas was cautious and very, uh, he was not an aggressive type of, he, he was scared he, he would get out too far and he'd get his head chopped off. And he didn't want to get to have, have that happen. But anyway, Darby called us at it this night, uh, this afternoon. He says, uh, all right, now this is, this is where it's going to be. I was there, General, uh, uh, this, uh, Major uh, Dobson, D-O-B-S-O-M. He was died here the other day. He was a brigadier general. And uh, General Damna, uh, he was there. Colonel uh, Damna and uh, Roy Murray. But anyway, we got a fan. He says, uh, now, we're going single file through this 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 riverbed. And we're, we're going back to Sesterno. Highway 6 and 7 run out of Rome to Casino. Those two highways. Our, our objective was to get back in and cut off those highways. And then the 3rd and 4th, uh, 45th Division was going to come in there and, and, and relieve us. Well, General, I mean, Colonel Darby told us, Chuck Johnstrom, he was right there with me, and, uh, and he said, boys, he said, I want to tell you this. He said, if, if this thing don't work, this is not my plan. He said, I have not been able to do get the intelligence or do any scouting patrol. He said, I, I have never done this before, but I'm going to have to send you all in because uh, they put the pressure on me to get to be done. So we got to, got lined up there. And I was, I was the first man through. Major Dodson was the second man through. But we, we lined out there, and we got about four miles back in line. And the first thing I did, I, I run into the machine gun. We can knock it out. It's just easy. And then we saw artillery over here, 88 battery fire. And they asked me to, uh, I went back to Major Dodson. I told him, I said, well, you know, we can knock those things out. We'd have a pretty good night's nice work done right there. We can knock it artillery out. And, I said, and he says, uh, he said, nope. He said, I'm going to contact Darby. But Darby had given us orders not to radio in unless, uh, for nothing. And not to fire shots. We were supposed to slip through. You hadn't fired any shots no, no, at, at no, this no, time. No. Uh, but we got. Yeah. <coughs> he called Darby and tried to call Darby and put a set up for radio and he couldn't get it. So we, he said, "Oh, we, our orders. We got our orders. Let's go." So we headed on out and right across the tanks, crossing the road down there. And that was bad enough. That scares you to death up against the tank with a little tops of something machine gun. But anyway, uh, we got across that road without being discovered. We got on down there a little ways and this old boy, Lucky Lockers, he was in my company and he was down there. He ran across the German down there and he 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 cut his he was trying to cut his throat and uh, he didn't do a good job that that German was screaming. <laughs> you know, I mean it was bloody murder and and uh, he, uh, that, that, that kind of put, put us on, on, on notice that they knew about it. But anyway, I, I just.
jumped up out of this ditch and ran across the uh, road there into Olive Orchard. And uh, Dotson, right, Major Dotson, right back there. We got in there, there was a bivouac here in this, in this Olive Orchard, and Germans sleeping every day. It was a bivouac for the Germans? Yeah. And, they were. and, it was, and, and we got in there. <laughs> He, uh, we started cutting loose, and, we, and, and, and he, he said, he told me, Major Miller was a commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion. He said, you go back uh, and get Major Miller and bring him up here. They should lead him up here. So I said, all right. So I, I mean, bullets were flying every day. Well, you couldn't believe how, how, how bad it was. But anyway, I, I got, I never forget, I, I had a horror. I was crawling on my belly down through some a great orchard and, and it's out of, or out of orchard and I got my leg and hung on a damn grapevine <laughs> and I thought, well, thank God, here I'm gonna get killed with a, with a grapevine. <laughs> but I got across a great, I got across the road, run into a bunch of Germans over there. I don't mind that. I mean, they were in the ditch that you rode them out. Yeah, yeah. But, but I jumped jumped across there and, and they asked me to go. I mean, I. I knew about where the Major Miller ought to be. Was that when you shot these Germans? Yeah. I mean, you yeah. you, you had a Thompson yeah. submachine. Yeah, yeah. But I jumped across the, and uh, I worked my way about, I don't know, about maybe a mile back here, where I thought Major Miller ought to be. Now, I, I saw a third uh, rain battalion boy. I said, a sergeant, I said, where is, where is Major Miller? He showed me a hole. He said that's where he was a few seconds ago. He gone. And he was he was one he shell was, hit on the he was, he was artillery shell hit. But uh, anyway, you know, it was just it was just chaos. I mean you just yeah. couldn't believe. And uh, was this and this was Sisterno? Yeah, this was Sisterno. Yep, yep. But anyway we I I I was very, very anxious to get back to my boat on my company. I want to get back to where I belong. So I started crawling back, and I got up to this roadway that before I got into Olive Ocean, and the tanks was up here firing down this roadway. I mean, it was just a solid mass of fire. I couldn't get across. And so, so Captain Shuntram and, and Captain Sam was right there in the ditch with me. And I bet you there were 15 dead rangers in this ditch. And we was laying there trying to uh, cover ourselves in fire. And uh, finally, the Germans, we had a we had a, a aid station set up there with our wounded. And we had a doctor with us, uh, who went in with us. And, and they had, uh, the Germans had sent a scout car around back and, and captured those wounded boys. And they put them up on the road, just walking wounded, and put them. He had a loudspeaker on this, on this car, on this scout car, the German did. And he had a machine gun, and he sprayed up right down the road there. And then he put these boys up on. He said, "Now y'all don't give up." He said, uh, "He said uh, we're gonna kill them. We're gonna mow them down." Well, I, uh, I I didn't trust the Germans no more than they trusted me. So uh, I, uh, Captain Shunstrom was the toughest man I ever knew in my life. He was a killer. He was a real killer. But anyway, he says. Uh, he said, boys, we out of ammunition. He said, we might as well get up. You were out of ammunition? Yeah. You couldn't be resupplied? No, no, we was, we was about eight, nine, seven, eight miles back in German lines, and we couldn't get down. And they couldn't get to us. And so we got up there. It was just about getting dark, too. So they, we got up on that roadway, maybe 250 of us. It was seven, it was approximately 700 of us that went through. About 250 of us left, and we got them on the road. And, uh, and that was your company? That was no, that was, that was the first, first and third battalion. Oh, all, oh, of, oh. all of us left. See, a, a ranger battalion, uh, it was only about 350 men. Oh, okay. <coughs> See, you had six companies of, uh, of uh, six men each. But uh, uh, we got up there, and we started, uh, they, they marched us back. Well, you did surrender. Yeah, yes. We had had no alternative. I mean, and, and when Chuck Shuffman gave up, I mean, you better, you better believe it was time to give up. That was your captain. Yeah. 
so uh, I uh, we gave up, and uh, it was about 250 of the rest of them killed and wounded there. And we inflicted over the day, the history will tell you that we inflicted over a thousand casualties at that moment. And we did, we, we, we were knocking them off left and right. But they put us in a ditch down there and uh, told me this says, uh, and put machine guns up all the way around this, this, this ditch. And they said, my, I said, well, they go mow us down. And they waited for nightfall, but they backed some trucks up there and moved us on those trucks and moved us Rome, to Rome, Italy, which was about uh, 25, 30 miles up the road. And we got up there and uh, they took the uh, films, of, uh, the propaganda films. They used that film to, uh, as propaganda and they said the elite American troops. We have the elite American troops. You had your ranger yes, at you, yeah, yeah. and uh, they uh, we were marching to the Coliseum uh, in, in Rome. They marched right by the Coliseum. Right by the Coliseum. I got a picture of that thing, uh, a tape of that thing somebody gave me. But uh, he, uh, then they moved us on up to Italy, uh, on up north of Italy, uh, Rome, where we stayed for maybe two to three weeks. Then they moved us out by the rail. They were going to move us out by rail to uh, to Munich. They were going up through the Brenner Pass, and we uh, got straight by planes. So we had to go back. Another week went by, and we got down in these trucks, and they put us on these trains, and they were going to move us from, uh, from this prison camp up through Florence, Italy, on up to Milan, and on through. The, the, the Brenner Pass, and uh, they gave us one little piece of bread about this wide, and that was about two days later. We were hungry, I was really hungry. And so that, that, that got me to think, I said, I, I can do something, I can give me something to eat. And this old boy by, by the name of Raymond Sadowski, I know I forget his name, he's from uh, Hartford, Connecticut. He was in the box car with me, it was a hundred of us in this little box car. And I, uh, he called me over there and he uh, said he had, had a piece of steel that he was trying to get out of the floor of the box car. So I got out there with him and started hitting him and I finally got it loose. And inside the box car they have a porthole about this big around, then they have a petition here and then they have another porthole right here. That was where the air come through that we could breathe. And then they had barbed wire on the outside of the boxcar. Then they had a German guard sitting up on top of the boxcar. And uh, I thought about it for a good while. And I said, well, but anyway, I started working working this. If I could get that petition loose in between the two portholes, I could, I'd could. i have it big enough for my body to get to. So I, I got that piece of steel and I started working on that petition and I got it loose. And uh, then I worked the barbed wire loose on the outside, and I got me a GI blanket and I tied it on the inside of the boxcar and let it fly out the porthole. And I had to go out here first. And all the time my thoughts were, I said, now I got to keep away from these wheels of the train. If I get thrown under this same thing, it's going to get me up. So I got out to the other side of that thing and I hung over the side of that wood. And uh, like it and push it. And uh, finally, I got a clear shot and I pushed out just as hard as I could. And I must have rolled 50 or 100 yards in that big old rock and gravel on the side of that big road. And the German guard started shooting at me. He was, it was dark. He, could, he couldn't see me. And uh, I got away. But I told this boy before I jumped, I told this boy, uh, Arthur Lyons, he was from Lowell, Massachusetts. I said, Red, I said, hey, I'm on jump. We just passed that trussle up here, that little bridge up there. I'm going back to that bridge. I'll wait for you for an hour. If, I don't, if you don't show up, I'm gone. So sure enough, he, he, I heard some more firing. And a little while later, he, he came up with Red. And uh, so he and I took off together. And we were, ran for about five miles. We got up there, and uh, this old Italian was, uh, I walked up there and knocked on this door. I had we had to have something to eat. So I, I asked this this lady came to the door and I said, uh, we're American prisoners, we're gay and we're hungry. We gotta have something to eat. She said
said, would you please not come in to this house because the Germans would kill us if they if, if, decided, if we had them. She spoke English. Well, it was broken English. Okay. She had broken English, and I could speak a little broken Italian. But anyway, I, I said, well, I thought, but I, and I decided I was going to leave her alone. So we went, left her, went on down the road another two or three miles. And, and the man, this was two or three o'clock in the morning. And this man came along on the bicycle, and I said, uh, I said, man, he ain't got no business at this time of night, you know, on a bicycle. I said, he was up to no good. I said, I, he might be with the underground. It might be able to help us. So he went into his house over there and pulled his bicycle out there. Then I went over and knocked on the door. He came to the door and I told him who it was. I told him America on the escape prison. And he took us in there. And he had a loaf of bread that was that big around. And over there, and I said, man, man we ate that. that and they, the Italians eat raw bacon. And that's that's their meat. Uh, they eat raw bacon. They don't cook the bacon. They just eat, to eat it raw. And he had a little cheese and uh, bread, and I ate. It, uh, it made I, you sick. Man, man, I was so sick. I couldn't sit. But Red, Red was sick with the flu anyway. But anyway, they took you know, the Italian farmhouse, uh, the garage. I mean, the the barn is attached to the house, and their cow and their horse. He's right there in the haystack, right there next to the house. So he said, y'all sleep in here. So we went back in. I was laid down. And I was sick from eating too much. So back up to three hours later, I heard something come to the door. And this man come out there, and he was going, hooking up his horse to his wagon, uh, bugging it. And I went over there and called him. I thought we were going to have to. I didn't know what we were going to have to do. If you had gone after the Germans, we were going to stop him. But uh, he told me that he was going in town to get in touch with the underground. So uh, his, I, was, I just couldn't decide whether we would knock him off, take it off, or what. Uh, but anyway, this, his wife came out, and she told me in, in, in broken English that her son was a prisoner of war in America that he had uh, written to her and told her how nice he was being treated up there. And that uh, she wanted to help us. Was there anything we, she could do for us? And I had had my clothes washed in about a month. And I told her I wanted a hot bed. I wanted a tub of hot water. And I wanted her to wash my clothes. And she did. <laughs> and so we trusted her from that point. Yeah. Is so, that when you moved into town, they moved you? Yeah, 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 yeah. But that old man came back yeah. that night and he said he got in touch with the underground that they would be out on the bicycles on Sunday. So, uh, showed up, uh, Sunday they came, they brought us a suit of clothes. I got rid of my GI club, uh, uniform, but I, they didn't have a pair of shoes big enough to fit my big feet, so I had to wear my GI boots, but uh, everything else was. Uh, Civilian, and uh, I was blind headed back in those days, and uh, over over red, he was just red headed as he could be. And he had never seen a red headed Italian or a blind headed Italian, he was a black kid. But anyway, we got on those, those bicycle roads in town, and it was uh, two British boys, one South African, and one, one uh, Welsh boy there in this house, apartment. And they, this old man and woman was the, uh, they guarded, I mean, they, 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 they were the caretaker of the house. So we got up there and they, uh, six of us was in that room, in that house, in the park. And it was upstairs. It was right downtown in, in Florence. Uh, the square was just a block away. You were in Florence? In Florence, it? And uh, you could look out on the road, the, the one that I was, I would look out there and see these people walking to work. And it was crowded, pretty crowded, people going back and forth to work. And at noon, they would get off for lunch or something. And uh, we'd been there about three weeks. And I, I decided that uh, it was snow up in the mountains. It was cold. It was dead well. It was in January. That was in January, February, 1945. Right. 44. 44. 44. But anyway, I... Uh, 
my, my thought was that we, if we could get to the mountains <coughs> and follow the apps, maybe work work our way back down south, or maybe work over to uh, to to the coast and get some get over to Yugoslavia. We we probably think that we might do that. Venice, we could get to Venice, but we couldn't travel in the, in the in the snow. And another thing is we couldn't travel on, on, on low roads because the Germans had that blame. We had to travel in the mountains to travel. <coughs> so I uh, I was going to wait till the, the snow broke and I was going I was going to head for the mountains. And uh, the Germans, uh, two of these boys, British boys, they they could speak fluent Italian. They went in town to the bar one night. And Red and I, we know it blew from that apartment. But uh, <coughs> they decided if they were going to uh, the, the Gestapo, spotted them and followed them back to our apartment. So the next morning, about 11 o'clock, I looked out the window. Right at noon, right at noon. And I didn't see anybody moving on the street out there. I told Red, I said, get your stuff ready, buddy. I said, look out there. You don't see anybody moving out there. I said, something's happening. You're going to Shout out for Somebody come running up the door to warn us. And we, this old man went down there and asked the door. And about that time, he, he took off. <coughs> when a German, the Germans came down here and they, Surrounded the house, set up machine guns and went to the house. And we, uh, I said to myself, now what in the heck are we going to do that? Uh, we didn't have any guns. So I got up and I uh, got on top of the, uh, I, I decided my chances were better than if I got up on the roof of the house. So I jumped up on the roof of the house, red followed. And about that time, the German broke through the door downstairs, and the old man, the woman that was super, the superintendent of the house, they they came up on top and they got run, started running toward the front of the house. They got shot off. They got killed. The Germans killed. Them. <coughs> they killed them. Yeah. I laid flat on the ground, on the roof, uh, and uh, it took them an hour, hour and a half for the Germans to uh, finally come in and get us. They found a fan. Yeah, oh yeah. They came up, uh, the first thing I saw was a German little pistol waving me right in the face. They, in a black, a yeah. big old black coat. Or, you know, you know, one of the great yeah. coats. But yeah. anyway, I, they were scared yeah. as we were. But anyway, we, they took us down to a civilian prison down in Florence. And they put us in a dungeon down there. You couldn't see daylight. We didn't see daylight over three days. And we was, the six of us were in a cell, and we had about that much space and to lay lay down flat on our back. And they had a, had a wooden pot, they probably over there for us to urinate on what they had to do, and emptied once a day. And uh, give me a piece of bread, a little piece of bread, and that was it. That was it. That was it. But you were never. Ill, you were never treated, they just didn't feed you. And you were in solitary confinement at that time. Probably because you'd escaped. Well, that, that was, I think it what they were, they were trying to do was figure out what to do with us. Oh, oh, they was trying to did, find out, uh, they, 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 they didn't know, they wanted to get us back in the regular prison system, I guess. Did, did they ever in, interrogate you? Yes. They tried to find out, uh, uh, and they were pretty brutal at times because they wanted to find out this organization, the underground organization, and we wouldn't. Oh, yeah. Would you, did you all stay pretty close to name, rank, and serial number? Yeah, I did, I did. You know, the yeah. more, the more they beat up on you, the less you say. And, uh, but anyway, we didn't, I, yeah. that was the only time I was really, really, really beat up in it, it was down there. But uh, this one boy like to die down there, and he, I, I, I finally got, got this Italian, this was an Italian civilian prison, and I told this guy that this guy was going to die if somebody didn't come down and hit him. 
and this and show up this battalion went to the Red Cross. I told them to go to the Red Cross and have the representatives to come down and, and they did. They finally come down there after about thirty days. And they got us out of there and put us back in the regular and that, that's, system. That's when you moved on up to the Brunner Pass yeah, in yeah, yeah, Germany. Yeah. To near Munich. Yeah. And uh I believe you stayed, Toby, you stayed down until the war ended? No, no, no. I, I, no. They, uh, in Munich, was at Mooseburg, there's a little town called Mooseburg, right out of, uh, 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 Munich. But anyway, they, they, this was a clear part of all privileges. And they sent me, uh, sent the rest of my boys, all my friends, they sent them down to uh, 2A, which was a work camp, and they had worked out on the farms down in Poland and mm -hmm. all down in that. And I was, I was classified as security risk because I gave them. So they put me in the maximum security prison set, uh, system. They sent me to Berlin. And I was right out of Berlin most of the time, 3A and 3B, Stalag 3A and 3B. But uh, they treated us right away. Well, we got one Red Cross parcel a month. The rest of the system we got it once a week. Yeah, that's what you mentioned the other day. Now, you stayed down in that area until the war ended, yeah. and then, then you, you, you you headed east and yeah. trying to get up with the Americans. Well, I was, uh, oh. we was right along the Elbe River up around uh, Torgau, a little town called Torgau. That was about 20, 25 miles from there. The Russians and the Americans met at this uh, on the Elbe River at, at Torgau. And uh, I, we had a shortwave radio system that was set that we had yeah. bought and put together. And we, we, could, we had pieces of the news and we knew what was yeah. going on. See, another, when the, uh, the uh, Battle of the Bulge happened down there, yeah. a lot of those boys came into our prison camp and they brought a lot of information into us. We, we kept each other in part of it. It was, it was over 100,000 of us American prisoners in there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, then you, uh, the war ended in uh, April, is that right? Yeah, April or May, May. Of 45. You were a prisoner, how long were you a prisoner? Uh, we were in uh, January yeah. 31st, 1944. And you? January 31st, 1944 till, uh, till May. Uh, and and then in May when you uh, when did you meet up with your first American about that? Well, I I, yeah. I I jumped to prison camp. I jumped the I jumped the fence and I was ready to go home. And, and, and I jumped that fence there, and uh, the Russians were up there, and I had uh, 20 25 miles, and they were fighting all around us. Well, they were still fighting. Oh yeah, the Germans were, and, the, and the Russians were fighting. They they were they were, they, they hated each other. So I, I, I worked my way 20, 25 miles from there up to the town called Toya. And I tried to, had, had to get across the bridge there to the American side over the Elbe River. And the Russians wouldn't let me across. I told them who I was and everything, but they still wouldn't let me across. So I decided I was gonna have to swim across the Elbe River. I, I was going home. But I went up the river about uh, five miles swam across that night. I, I floated across, swam across the river, got over there. And this old colonel from the, I forgot what outfit it was, an American, he, they took me to him. He said, son, you sleep in my bunk here. Yeah. He gave me some warm clothes. Did you still have your dog tag? You were in, I had my dog tag, but I didn't have anything. That, that's how you, I mean, yeah. you kept those. Yeah. That but was your key. He told me he'd have a plane flying there the next day to pick me up. He showed up the next day. Uh, and, and you headed back home? I went mean, from there to La Harlem, France. And uh, Camp Lucky Strike. And uh, oh, it was just, it, this was a clear point for all prisoners. Yeah. Isaac Howe flew in there one day, and uh, we'd been in there maybe a week, 10 days. And uh, Isaac, I was a guy said, boys, he said, y'all have carried the ball for us a long time. He said, pass that down for us. 
do for you. So what can we do? We said, well, we want to go home. We've been in here 10 days. He looked at that gentleman over there. He said, gentlemen, I told you these boys are supposed to be out here within a certain amount of time. He said, well, we didn't have transportation. I don't know. I said, get it. The next day we moved out of there. Got a hall heading to the station. Now we yeah. landed. We landed at uh, Staten Island, uh, Fort uh, uh, Camp Shanks, Camp Shanks, New York. And my stomach was in you know, terrible shape at that point. I couldn't eat. It, uh, it had shrunk so much that you couldn't eat it. Uh, yeah. What you eat wouldn't make you sick. Yeah. Uh, I got there to Camp Shanks, and I told this old boy, I said, "You get us a bunk." He said, "You see a PX over here? I'm going." Get us something to eat. I went over there and got us a gallon of ice cream, a gallon of milk. We went back in and ate that stuff, and we got sick as we could get. A little okay. while later, they came in there and said, they got a, they got a, a smoking yeah. board over here. Yeah. And we, yeah. well, you can eat what you want to. It's roast beef, steaks, everything else. Yeah. And we couldn't, I couldn't do anything with it. What did you weigh when you, how much did you lose? You told me the other day. I, I lost around 100 pounds. Uh, yeah. I lost from about yeah. two to 200 down to less than 100. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, Ken, that has been a wonderful story. It's not a wonderful story, but I am glad that you shared it with us. Yeah. One thing I would like to uh, add to it was that when I came back, they, they uh, sent me to uh, Fort Myers, Virginia, to, uh, where they had the honor guards for the tomb of the unknown soldiers and the honor guards for the dignitaries and so on and so on, uh, the White House, the guards for the White House. And I was sent up to Washington, D.C. as an honorary guard. And we'd go out to meet the dignitaries that they kind of fly yeah. to Washington. But it was a real honor and a, and a real thing. Well, it should have been. And a real thing. Now, Colonel, it was a William Darby. William Odell. And uh, you, there was a movie made. Yes. And who, who, Jan, I made a note, it was James Garner, who played the part of, of Madonna. Madonna. Yeah. And I believe your friends told me the other day, they were fairly accurate. They, they were something. But, uh, you know, but, it's, it's, any movie, yeah. they got to sell them. they got to sell them. Oh, movie. yeah. So they're a little, little yeah. fiction in. But uh, you're always going to be a hero in Decatur County, and now, uh, you'll be on tape, and the story of Ken Markham and Darby's Rangers. Thank you very much.